welcome. I'm David Wessel. I'm director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy here at Brookings. Uh, the past couple of years have been rather unusual ones for the American economy. We put the economy into a medically induced COVID. We had an enormous... <laughs> We had an enormous amount of fiscal and monetary response. We had a much quicker recovery than I think many of us anticipated. And perhaps in part because of all those things, we got more inflation than we had hoped for or expected. Um, there are a lot of things in the economy that are quite puzzling now. Like how is it that unemployment is still very low, but the inflation rate is falling? And so, we invited Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors here to explain all those questions, particularly the hard to answer ones. Um, Jared's gonna talk about where the economy's been, where it's going, and uh, his remarks are gonna be followed by a panel moderated by my colleague, uh, Louise Shainer, with uh, Greg Mankiw, who is the Robert Barron Professor of Economics at Harvard University, and was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the George W. Bush administration. The other panelists will be Seth Carpenter, who did time at the Treasury and the Fed, but is now Global Chief Economist at Morgan Stanley. And uh, for full disclosure, Morgan Stanley is a supporter of economic studies at Brookings. And our third speaker will be Heidi Scherholz, who's uh, president of the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, assuming she shows up, in which case, if she doesn't show up, she won't be on the panel. Um, <laughs> I want to. I want to say, and here she is. Just a dramatic entry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know you're just waiting out there for me. Um, I want to say a quick word about the Council of Economic Advisors, three-member council created by Congress in 1946. In my experience as a reporter, the CEA has absolutely no power. It only has influence, and its influence is directly related to the relationship between the members of the CEA and the president. And I think Jared is in a very good position to do that. He was, after all, an economic advisor to Vice President Biden in the early years of the Obama administration. Jared began his career as a musician. He played the double bass. He got a master's in social work. And he played jazz bands and did bar mitzvahs and weddings for years while counseling New York City's troubled souls. He then got a PhD in social welfare with an emphasis in economics at Columbia and came to Washington in the early 90s, and he's been involved in policy ever since, some in the government, some outside the government at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and the Economic Policy Institute. I think it's safe to say, I didn't check this with you, Jared, that you consider yourself a progressive economist. I've always found you to be very good at asking hard questions, often challenging the conventional wisdom, an excellent advocate, and very good at speaking about the economy and economic policy to a general audience, which I hope you'll do today. So with that, Jared Bernstein. Thank you for that, uh, thank you for that uh, really nice introduction. Uh, thank you uh, to David Louise, uh, the Hutchinson Center for the invitation. Um, the work of the center has been important to our White House economics team over this challenging period. And just the other day, we were on a Zoom meeting, and the question of fiscal impulse came up, and somebody quickly shared on the screen uh, the Hutchins tracker. And uh, they solved that, uh, answered that question for us. Your recent cautionary work on the debt ceiling has been especially welcomed. I knew David when he was a cub reporter at the Journal about 150 years ago. And uh, of course, I've learned a ton from Ben, Louise, Wendy, Don, Bill, Ron, and the rest of the team. What I hope to do today is to look at US macro from the perspective of our team at the White House, reflecting on where we were, where we are, and where we might be headed. I'll pause along the way to try to engage the panel and audience in some of the questions David alluded to, questions we view as consequential in, uh, in current uh, macro. Actually, let me go here to the summary. Um, uh, you see those right there in, in bullet four. What's the sacrifice ratio right now? How much activity do we need to give up for uh, inflation reduction um, and uh, uh, other, other points you see there. Um, I should also underscore from the outset that my talk comes to you in the spirit of humility in a period of uncertainty. And that's a, that's a spirit wherein as many questions are generated as answers. 
Uh, okay. So you're just getting organized here. Um, let's start by briefly collecting macroeconomic lessons many of us took from the last few cycles, not just for collection purposes, but to understand the framework many were working from in, the early, in, in early 2020 when the pandemic hit. Now, one theme of my work has long been that estimates of U star, the lowest unemployment rate consistent with stable prices, was A, difficult to estimate within confidence intervals narrow enough to make the concept particularly useful for policy work, and B, too high. So the fact that recent a a expansions saw U fall below conventional estimates of U star, with inflation missing more from the downside of the Fed's target than the upside, was an important lesson, one that led many of us to trust data-driven policy more than star-driven policy. A related observation, one that was especially important for economically vulnerable workers who are hurt most by labor market slack, was that their labor force participation was lifted at both the extensive and the intensive margins by tight labor markets. In this way, many of the attributes of running a tight labor market, including stronger wage growth for middle and lower paid workers, uh, we can include uh, a uh, higher Y star as another uh, question uh, in the sense of, uh, uh, of, of a tricky uh, policy variable to estimate within uh, uh, an interval that makes it useful for, for our analysis. Others have pushed this sort of thinking further and made connections between chock full employment and productivity gains. To me, this makes some sense in theory. If tight labor markets raise labor costs, then discovering productivity gains can stabilize unit labor costs and preserve margins. Empirically, I wouldn't push that connection too far, but suffice it to say that U star is also, I'm sorry, Y star, potential GDP growth, I mean the potential level of real GDP, is also a moving target, one that's tough to estimate and therefore, as I mentioned, another tricky policy guidepost. Anyway, by early 2020, many of us believed that the price Phillips curve was pretty flat, that very full employment was an essential and reachable policy goal, that advanced economies, even through periods of pro-cyclical stimulus, tends to be far more demand than supply constrained. Note that these observations map in important ways onto the Bidenomics goal of bottom-up, middle-out growth that you heard about last night. The idea that if you're helping to bake the pie, you ought to get a fair slice. The president is acutely aware of the linkages between tight labor markets and workers' bargaining clout. I will add from the perspective of countercyclical policy that loomed large when the pandemic hit the economy, that there was evidence that we'd pulled our punches in past fiscal responses with the result that initial expansions were quite weak. The last few decades, uh, the last few, uh, <clears throat> the last few decades saw quite slow recoveries out of troughs that were initially labeled jobless, wageless, or both. This certainly isn't the case with the current expansion. Uh, in the first conversation I had with President Biden when he asked me to help on the campaign, he emphasized the joint health and economic shocks caused by the pandemic and early conversations of the team that led to the American Rescue Plan were founded on this insight. The implication for countercyclical counter policy was that, there was, was that there needed to be a dual vaccination and fiscal release strategy, or what became the talking point, shots in arms and checks in pockets. And that's what we did. We understood that executing simultaneously on both vaccine and, and fiscal support were essential to avoid scarring. Hard-hitting, quick-acting policies were needed to help families and businesses get to the other side of the crisis, and that shore could be brought closer with effective distribution of both the vaccine and transfers. As you see on the figure on the left, the black line is uh, on the right axis is cumulative vaccine doses administered, which really takes off uh, in early 21. Um, <clears throat> uh, we needed to push back on the sudden loss of labor earnings, potential waves of evictions, nutritional shortfalls of vulnerable families, sharp increases in child poverty, loan defaults, and the needs of the health system. Note also in the movement between the last two bars in the figure, the last two blue bars, the negative fiscal impulse in 2022 as the transfers diminished, uh, fiscal complement to the Fed's tightening and pushing back on inflationary pressures. <clears throat> 
Now, strong demand plus constrained supply helped unleash these price pressures in 2021, exacerbated in February of 22 by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The combination of pent-up savings and snarled supply chains also contributed to inflation's rise. One way this played out was through shifting consumer preferences from in-person services to goods, where demand for goods grew quickly and sharply, while their supply response was near-term relatively inelastic. In fact, as you see in red, uh, that's the goods services ratio line, that shift is still in the process of normalizing. I'll have more to say about inflation in a moment, but in the spirit of sharing lessons, let me say a word about the T word, transitory. I'm not defending its use, and it's clear that its temporal ambiguity was problematic from a communications perspective. Did it mean two weeks, two quarters, two years? But speaking for myself, and I suspect many others, the idea was that there were things behind the 2021 inflation that were clearly temporary. Now, the disruption in computer chips and their impact on vehicle prices provides a clear example. This figure shows the contribution, not the growth rate, the contribution of used cars and trucks to the year-over-year -year change in the CPI over the past few decades. The average contribution of this component over the full period is zero, and most recently, uh, this component has been a negative contributor. But those remarkable outliers you see there are, to my eyes, a classic example of a temporary shock, though again, I say that while recognizing the temporal ambiguity of the term. Turning to where we are now, current macro is raising a, a number of, of rich, uh, pressing, and consequential questions. After playing my bit part in the political economy of the past few years, I'm quite sympathetic to the old proverb, may you live in uninteresting times. <laughs> On the other hand, one of the reasons I'm pleased to be uh, here with you today is to dis discuss these questions with Louise and the panel. I find this figure to be useful in motivating the conversation. On the x-axis is real activity with higher numbers meaning less activity, so think unemployment or whatever slack variable you prefer. On the y-axis, think trend, core, or underlying inflation. So this is the Price-Phillips curve space, though we could, and some are, having this debate in beverage curve space. The two lines reflect different sacrifice ratios, that is, different trade-off magnitudes between less activity and lower inflation. The higher line represents a more painful trade-off. Another way to frame the question posed here is how much inflation reduction can we achieve on the vertical part of the curve and how much on the flat part? Because it's both theoretically interesting and empirically consequential, it's worth pausing a beat on the question of nonlinearities. While some researchers noted in this slide, uh, as you see in the last bullet, uh, have long argued this point, I believe that pandemic economics, specifically joint shocks to the economy's supply and demand sides, where strong demand in a particular sector, in this case goods, occurs before supply can adjust, can lead to sharp and fairly sudden capacity constraints. And this, in turn, leads to convexities like that in the figure from Serato and Giddy showing a city's derived price Phillips curve uh, that became quite steep in recent years. You see the slope there of negative 0.85. As I note in this slide, thinking about these constraints on the economy supply side, I don't think I ever said the words dwell time, which is how long shipping containers stay in ports, until 2021. And then I woke up every day and checked dwell time, and my colleagues and I were, were checking the metric daily. Um, yet another way to think about the question implied by the figure is how much inflation can we uh, get from supply chain unsnarling, burning off of excess savings, and greater labor supply, all of which I'd put in the less painful bin, versus how much will require demand destruction, which I'd put in the more painful bin. And to underscore a point that should never get lost in this context, the pain of demand destruction is not equally shared. It inevitably hits the most vulnerable, a fact I promise you is not lost on our president. Thus far, we've seen significant inflation reduction without giving much up at all on unemployment. Many have pointed out, and I agree, that year-over-year -year inflation measures are less informative when higher frequency movements are occurring. 
So along with the usual time series figures that you see in the first slide, that's just PCE core and headline and core inflation, three month changes annualized, and you can see somewhat of a rise and fall there. Um, uh, I find that the, the, the approach in these bar charts here um, to be a useful way of uh, tracking inflation's motion. Now, e let me explain what these bars are showing. Each set of bars takes the annualized change in inflation over one, three, six, and 12-month intervals. So when the bars are sloping up, that typically means that inflation is accelerating and vice versa. And by running these annualized rates in different months, we can capture inflation's dynamic profile at that time. So for example, consider the first slide on the right there, um, which is headline CPI inflation. In March 2021, which is that first set of bars, I can't tell what color it is because I'm colorblind, um, but uh, you'll see in March 21, the bars show, uh, sh slope up pretty sharply. 12-month inflation, around 2%, but one-month inflation annualized all the way up to 8 So what you see there is the bar showing, uh, sloping up sharply, showing that inflation was taking off. At the end of the year, in December 21, that's the middle set of bars of each set, inflation was a lot more elevated and still accelerating. But the most recent reading, which is the reddish bars, um, they, uh, they show a clear deceleration. The PCE core, which is on the bottom, shows a roughly similar pattern, though the recent deceleration has been more muted. Now, Chair Powell's de uh, inflation decomposition, which I think he may have uh, broken out on this very stage, breaking inflation, uh, core inflation down to core goods, housing services, and non-housing services, which I'm going to call NHS, so I don't have to keep saying non-housing services, provides a useful, useful perspective. Here on the left, you see a picture of CPI core goods against the New York Fed's supply chain disruption index, with both coming down sharply in recent months. That's an important part of, uh, of uh, the disinflation we're currently uh, seeing. Uh, we expect the current softening of home prices, including some actual reductions in new rentals, to start showing up in inflation prints uh, in the back half of this year. But non-housing services inflation, as the bar chart shows, has, on the other hand, been moving sideways. And again, I, 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 you probably shouldn't get so enamored of your own slides, but um, you know, I, I think when you set it up this way, it, it shows you that, that those orange bars or reddish bars, they're, they're kind of flat. And that's the most recent, that's the December 22 um, PCE uh, non-housing services inflation. So that's proving to be more sticky than the other components of this uh, decomposition. Um, chair, uh, so uh, um, we've developed uh, at CEA, so this is something you haven't seen before unless you read Greg Ipp's column this morning. Um, we've developed an index of non-housing services wage growth. So thus far I've showed you non-housing services price growth uh, but part of the argument uh, 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 around non-housing supermarkets and wage growth because it's the labor-intensive sector. So we developed an index of non-housing services or NHS wage growth using detailed industry average hourly wages weighted by each sector share of 2019 labor costs in final consumption of services excluding food, energy, and housing. And here you see that the year-over-year -year growth rate in this series remains elevated, though it has clearly slowed quite sharply. Uh, the table to the right there examines, uh, um, the, uh, examines the correlation of this series with NHS inflation, showing that in a simple price Phillips curve model with wage growth taking the, price of slack, taking the place of slack, this wage series has a smaller out of sample error than the others. So, you know, kind of a, a better correlation with non-housing services uh, can be found in this in this uh, NHS wage series. So we think the fact that it has decelerated is uh, instructive and, and hopefully kind of hopeful in that regard. Now, the wage dynamics in the prior figure raised the next pressing question for current macro. If U is less than U star, if job markets are really that tight, why are we seeing wage deceleration? David posed the same question. The slide offers a number of hypotheses. Um, uh, perhaps U isn't below. U star. Well, 
As I've noted, it's awfully hard to pin down U-star, but many analysts have come to prefer the vacancies unemployment ratio as a slack measure, and that seems to be well above any version of uh, VU-star. That is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it really is quite elevated. So while I can make an argument that there's been some softening of labor demand, I don't think there's been much. I'll come back to that slide in a second. At least before the latest ECI release, some argued, well, maybe nominal wage growth isn't slowing. That's getting hard to maintain, and we've developed a composite measure, compositionally adjusted, which I think is important these days, that shows clear slowing in the growth of nominal pay. So, with the caveat that wage data are particularly noisy and that the level of wage growth is still elevated, I'd call this a legitimate head scratcher. EPI's Josh Bivens, a close watcher of factor shares, suggests that labor share of corporate income is still quite low, despite the persistent strength in the job market, and this could help explain slower nominal wage growth. This has led Bivens to remind us that lower profit margins are a source of non-inflationary wage gains, a point Vice Chair Brainer underscored in a, uh, underscored in a recent speech. I note that this channel is highly consistent with President Biden's emphasis on tight labor markets as equalizing. I'm also sympathetic to a view from a recent Jorda et al. paper, which found that the pass-through from inflationary expectations to wages has been highly elevated in this expansion out of the pandemic, which is another nonlinearity. Now, measuring expectations is a challenge, and we haven't seen a great deal of movement in longer-term expectations. Near-term expectations have, however, come in quite a bit, especially in the UMICH survey, and perhaps that's putting downward pressure on nominal wage growth, even at very low unemployment. I tend to think of one-year inflation expectations as moved around by retail gas prices, but that doesn't mean they're not impactful, and I think that uh, that study is, is but one study, but it's, it, I found it kind of convincing of this point. Before I close with a round of tailwinds and headwinds to the forecast, let's briefly look at where we are from the perspective of job gains and household finances, echoing some of the President's points last night, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and the rescue plan with its dual focus on hitting back hard on both health and cyclical shocks, how that sets us up for one of the strongest and uh, fastest labor markets uh, on record. Um, uh, sorry, this, this slide just shows um, how quickly uh, the uh, 2020 payrolls climbed back to their pre climbed back and, and exceeded their pre uh, pandemic peak. Uh, not just a bounce back, I mean, definitely there's a strong bounce back, but you also see just a very different shape of this jobs recovery uh, out of the trough where the others were, as I mentioned earlier, often labeled as initially jobless. The strength of fiscal and monetary support must also be credited with preventing deep, damaging, and lasting economic scarring, claims supported by evidence regarding the wide variety of household finances shown in this figure. Thinking back on my days in the Obama administration, when household balance sheets were in a very different place, today's balance sheet conditions have been an important complement to the durability of the ongoing expansion. Now, in thinking about where we're headed. I find this sequencing model from research at Goldman Sachs at Goldman Sachs to be instructive. Slower GDP growth drives slower payroll growth, which leads to slower wage growth, nominal wage growth, and finally slower price growth. So this is a very sequencing flow chart, very much in Phillips curve space, where you look at the starting point, where you are now, where you have to get to in each sequence in the flow uh, to get from uh, below trend GDP growth to finally slow, uh, core inflation closer to target. Um, <clears throat> by some core-like measures, Real GDP has decelerated from above trend to below trend, so step one has kind of a check. But closing the gap between demand and supply in the labor market remains a work in progress. As I've shown, uh, on the other hand, as I've shown, we're seeing uh, some slowing, non-trivial slowing in wage and price growth. In this regard, one conclusion that you can draw from this moment is that the Phillips curve space in which many of us reside to one degree or another with its well-established hydraulics as in this flow chart may not quite apply or at least not fully apply to the current moment. Steps three and four in this slide, uh, slower wage growth and slower price growth, um, are arguably coming in more so than steps one and two. So where does that leave us? perhaps closer to post-shock or post-war economics, wherein recovering from a shock while rebuilding, 
and in the case of the Biden agenda, significantly expanding the economy supply side must be factored into the analysis. Now here's a list of some of the tail and headwinds that our team thinks about, all of which are familiar to you and most of which I've discussed already. On the new shocks, the political own goal I have in mind is around the debt ceiling. It's never anything but the height of irresponsible governments, governance to try to politicize or weaponize what should be a pro forma action. It is, in fact, an unequivocally clear constitutional obligation to defend our sovereign debt and pay for existing, existing spending obligations. But to play these games when they're in the, we're in the midst of transitioning to more steady, stable growth, with the Fed in the midst of a hiking cycle as the rate of inflation is coming down, is especially reckless. We're watching energy closely as well. The retail gas price remains about $1.55 below its peak from last summer. But we're closely watching refinery capacity, which has been tight over this expansion. China's reopening is a pressure point, though it's worth remembering that China is both a consumer of energy and a global distributor of refined product. Bottom line, with the war ongoing, the energy price remains a potential impactful uncertainty. I've already gone through most of, these, most of the tailwinds I just listed in that list, including generally solid balance sheet conditions, though we haven't looked at excess savings. Here we use a similar approach to some Hutching Center's work on this impact variable, and while we see some burn off of the excess aggregate at the end of the figure, the part under the average savings line remains smaller than the cumulative part above it, so I think there's still some juice there when it comes to excess savings. These potential shocks all bear close watching, but we on the Biden economics team, along with many of you who've advised us, and along with our counterparts in economies across the globe, We've all faced down shocks and tailwinds, expected and otherwise. It's been a challenging few years, and I suspect we'd all welcome a period of less interesting times. Among the lessons we've learned, more accurately relearned in this case, is the need to fix your countercyclical infrastructure. I'm thinking about unemployment insurance soft, uh, software, uh, for example, when the sun is shining, as you'll need it uh, in the next storm. The Internal Revenue Service was highly efficient in check and uh, child tax credit distribution, no question. But the investments in the agency from the Inflation Reduction Act are critical not only for getting tax evaders to pay their fair share, but for the continued improvements in the agency's functionality in the next downturn. But let us pause one last time and appreciate that at a time of massive uncertainty, wherein the world was dealing with a pandemic the likes of which we hadn't seen for a century, Macro policymakers amply and quickly met the challenge. Given the magnitude of the shocks, which have been further exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, the fact that the US has been at or near full employment since President Biden took office, that we face an increasingly credible and plausible path in, transitional, in transitioning to sustainable growth, that even the EU, with its greater exposure to commodity pressures from the war, is seeing a somewhat improved outlook all of these should be taken as testaments to the power of macro policy interventions in the face of shocks. To be clear, there are no victory laps, inflation remains too high, and we should, of course, always learn how we can do better next time. But if we can get away from the fevered pulse of social media, hyperpartisan critiques, and it only leads if it bleeds media takes, we can recognize, appreciate, learn from, and build on this success story for fiscal and monetary macro policy in offsetting some of the greatest economic shocks of our lifetimes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jared, for really interesting slides. Oh, this is so loud. Um, <laughs> all right, now we're going to give a chance to people to comment then, and we're going to come back to you. Um, I'm going to sort of talk about um, three, three buckets. I'm going to talk about fiscal policy. I'm going to talk about what's going on in the labor market. And I'm going to talk about the outlook for inflation and monetary policy. Um, and so we're going to start with Greg. 
to give us your take on, so Jared gave a pretty good grade to fiscal policy during the pandemic. Um, what, how, do you, how do you judge it? Completely unbiased. <laughs> well, yeah. well oh, thank you. And thank you, Jared, for a great presentation. That was really, that was really terrific. Um, I just want to make sort of three, three points. I want to talk first about the unusual nature of this recession. I then want to talk about fiscal policy and that we've had recently, and then I want to think about fiscal policy um, going forward. So first of all, we have to realize this is a very unusual recession. The standard recession is some sort of mistake, some sort of shock happens. Um, output and employment decline. We're unhappy with the decline in employment. We're trying to get employment back to normal as quickly as possible. That's usually takes a long time. Some recoveries tend to be very slow. Um, in fact, there was a literature almost 40 years ago that I participated in called the unit root literature. I won't tell you what, why it's called that. But anyway, it's always about the permanent, the persistence of economic fluctuations. And the, basically the bottom line from that literature is that fluctuations in GDP are so persistent, they're almost impossible to distinguish from permanent. That is one output declines, it never gets back to previous trend. Um, this was a very different session. This really was a, a recession by design. Policymakers saw the pandemic and they said, don't go out and spend, don't go to work unless you're an essential worker. And we basically, we, we purposefully put the economy into a recession. Um, uh, it, it people were willing to let people to come back once the situation changed. And, people, and was once we got the pandemic under control, once we got vaccines and so on. So if, you want to, if I can draw an analogy, so if, we, if we had daily data on, on GDP, uh, what we'd find is that there, we, we have a downturn of this sort every Saturday. And then, it, then we would quickly recover on Monday. So what we, what, we, so what we had was a very, very long weekend at home. <laughs> it's not so, just like weekends, we recover from weekends quite quickly. We, we could recover from, from, from this kind of quickly. So it was a very different kind of recession. And it's not surprising that the dynamics look very different in the data than in the previous ones. I thought Jared's um, picture about comparing the different recessions really showed how very different the dynamics here were. The second thing to say about it is because this was a recession by design, this, the fiscal policy was not a standard stimulus. If you think of sort of standard f fiscal stimulus, whether you're talking about the Bush tax cuts or the, the Obama you know, Recovery Act, it, the goal is to put people back to work. We want to expand aggregate demand. Here we weren't trying to put people back to work. We wanted them to stay at home. We told them to stay at home. That's why they were staying at home. We told them to. Um, so the, st the fiscal policy was not really stimulus in the normal sense. It might have had some stimulus effect, but that was not the motive for it. It was really disaster relief because we realized that people were suffering. This, this was going to be a very long weekend. They didn't have, they didn't have this, the financial resources to stay, stay at home for that long weekend, so we had to provide them so, this kind of disaster relief. Um, having said that, so I think it, it made sense as a form of disaster relief, but this, I think there was two problems with it in my mind. The first problem was that it was very poorly targeted. A lot of, a lot of money went out that probably didn't need to go out in exactly the form it did. So let me just give you just a couple examples. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which I think was very well-intentioned. I think we've, we, looking back, we sort of see that it was not very well-targeted. First of all, we've seen a lot of fraud, for sure. But even people who are not being fraudulent, any people who are getting it legitimately, a lot of the people we probably don't think really should have gotten it. So to give you an example, I remember um, Secretary, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin found out at some point that the, the hoity-toity prep school that his kids went to were getting millions of dollars from the Paycheck Protection Program. And he said, oh, no, no, that, 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 this, this is not the target for, for this. This is, this is, they, should, they shouldn't be getting this money. Well, as it turns out, I happen to be on the board of another hoity-toity prep school. And, and, uh, and they also got Paycheck Protection money. And we, we talked to lawyers, and absolutely as law is written, we did everything legally. Um, and so what Mnuchin may have thought was politically expedient to say this, they shouldn't go to his prep, kids' prep schools, but it was completely legitimate that it went there. Arguably, it's not what Congress intended, but that's the way the law was written. Uh, to give you another example, the, the, the expanded unemployment insurance, the extra $600 checks that people got, was very indiscriminate. I remember talking to a president of a university, not, not, not Harvard, another sort of major deep-pocketed university, and she was saying that, you know, so you send all our kids home, we don't... Um, I don't need as much janitors, but we have really deep pockets. So my, my inclination was to keep a janitors on staff. But my janitors tell me that if they went home, they got laid off, they'd get more and unemployment insurance. So I'm doing them a favor by keeping them employed. I don't know, I don't know what you did in the end of that. But, but that sort of shows how sort of poorly targeted um, this was. And the second basic problem with the, 
fiscal policy, I think, was that it was basically too large in aggregate. We spent too much money out there. You saw these, Jared showed you the excess saving. That's what we said. We sent lots and lots of money to people. And I think in particular the American Rescue Plan, the, which is the, one of the first um, acts of the uh, Biden administration. I, I voted for, J for Joe Biden, by the way, so I'm not here as a partisan. Uh, uh -huh. I voted for Joe Biden, but I thought the American Rescue Plan was too big. Um, and I wrote a column in the New York Times saying that about two years ago, saying this was risking inflation. Um, and I, was, I wasn't the only person saying this. Olivia Blanchard was saying it. I think Larry Summers was probably saying it more frequently than anyone else I know. Um, <laughs> Having, ha having said that, I don't think anybody predicted 8% inflation. Uh, certainly I was thinking inflation would creep up, but I wasn't thinking of get, get to 8. The only person I know, by the way, who said it would get to 8 was Jeremy Siegel of Wharton. Uh, and he did that by um, looking at M2, which is something that's not very fashionable these days. And I kind of wonder whether it's gone too far out of fashion. But basically, what happened was we sent people checks. People, we told people, you can't go out and spend it. You're stuck at home. So they stuck it in their checking account. And it sat there waiting until they said, we let, we, let, we, let, we let them off. Now, I don't think the aggregate demand was a full part of the inflation surge. I, I think Jared's absolutely right. There were a lot of different supply chain issues, shifts in composition of demand that are important. Um, but I think fiscal policy does deserve some of the blame for the inflation surge. OK, what, what, what's, what about fiscal policy going forward? Um, first, uh, Jared did not show us a path of the debt to GDP ratio up to now and going forward. But if he did, he'd say we basically realize that we're pretty much close to the peak debt to GDP ratio reached at the end of World War II. And CBO says under current policy, it's going to continue going up forever. Um, and at some point, we've got to deal with that. I think and, and no, four years is a short period of time. So under any president for four years, you can say, ah, that's a, that's a future problem. But at some point, that future comes, and uh, we need to worry about that. I think there's no possible way that if you stick to all of President Biden's promises, which is no cuts in entitlements, no taxes, on extra taxes for people making under 400000 a year. There's no way to fix the, 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 the long-run sustainability uh, problem um, on, on those set of commitments. Um, the, regarding future counter-cyclical fiscal policy, I don't think it's going to be anything like what we've seen in the past three years. So I don't think we've learned very much about normal recessions. I suspect the next recessions will be normal recessions. I certainly hope so. I think that this, I, this pandemic, it was, I think, it was very unusual. I don't expect to um, see something exactly like this. If we did see something like this, I'd want something much more, that's more targeted. But my guess is going forward, fiscal policy would be more the traditional stimulate aggregate demand to get people back to work. That future recessions will probably be more normal recessions, unlike the one we just, just experienced. I'll stop there. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so we're going to stay on fiscal policy a little bit if um, Seth or Heidi want to Weigh in, Heidi. Is there something that you saw from fiscal policy that you like that we should repeat in the next recession, or um, just? Yeah, I. I mean, one of the key things I want the lesson to be learned is that fiscal policy actually can generate really strong jobs recovery. <laughs> like, if you look at, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about this when I when I do my comments. But <laughs> if you're, you're sitting in December 2020. You know, we, we had already had the big, big surge of, you know, millions of jobs coming back as businesses that had locked down came online and brought back their workers that, had, that they had temporarily laid off. The recession was, or the, the recovery was faltering. We actually lost jobs in December 2020. At a very similar point in the recession following, um, in the recovery following the Great Recession, policymakers sort of mind-bogglingly turned towards austerity, and that directly led to our very, very weak and slow recovery from the Great Recession. And they didn't do that this time, right? Like, we had the, the um, package of December 2020 and then the, the American Rescue Plan in March of 2021, and those things led to this unbelievably strong jobs recovery that we have had it was, I mean, over the last two years, we added more than 12 million jobs. It's just a total game changer. So I do hope that's a lesson that policymakers really learn. Like, the pace of our recovery is a freaking policy choice, right? And we can choose to do something different. And we really showed how that's possible in this recovery. Great. Thanks. Seth, you have Yeah, I just make two, two comments on the fiscal side of things. And uh, I think... Greg for opening up by saying just how different or how unusual this recession is. Uh, very often in, in, in my profession, if you start off a, a pitch saying, well, this time is different, people laugh at you. But I think Greg very convincingly <laughs> made the case 
I don't know why it should be hard to make that case this time around. Anyone who's been living <laughs> through the past two or three years, I think, uh, hadn't lived through it before. Nevertheless, thank you for that initial point. Um, I want to, uh, you know, Greg's commentary on your critique of some of the fiscal policy, um, I guess I'd, 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 I'd want to agree with some cautiously and then push back cautiously uh, all through the lens of humility, having spent a bunch of my life at the Fed and then in the Treasury Department, uh, designing policy in real time with incomplete information is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, and so where I think I think the fiscal policy response was at its greatest was in the income replacement side of things. So as Greg said, a bunch of people lost their jobs or stayed home or didn't work in part because they were asked not to or because of the, the public health situation. And so in that sense, replacing those people's income uh, through government transfers seems like a reasonably targeted approach. Could it be perfect? No. The, the university where janitors perhaps could have made more uh, if they hadn't been kept on, I, I can believe those stories happen. I don't know for sure how widespread that was. Uh, and I think ultimately the question becomes, uh, are we letting the perfect be the enemy of the good in those sorts of things? I think where I, uh, so in general, I think the first several rounds of fiscal worked the way we, we probably wanted to. Uh, Greg said we probably had too much. Um, and there, I, I, I think I want to cautiously agree with Greg. In particular, uh, the last tranche, the direct transfers of cash, not particularly means tested. Again, always very difficult to calibrate these sorts of things and get the systems to work right in real time. But one does sort of that, that last sort of round of, of, of stimulus, one could sort of, I think, there start to, to quibble a little bit. Um, the challenge, though, in directly translating that fiscal policy to the inflation that we saw um, is, is a little challenging because we have a very, another part that's very diff different here is the pattern of the increase of inflation. Usually what happens when in, in cycles when inflation goes up uh, is lots of things are heavily correlated here. Clearly, very uh, initially a surge in goods prices, especially automobiles, and then only subsequently the, the other components. And so to me that says, the standard analysis any of us may have either learned or taught in university classes on, on economics about cyclically defined inflation probably isn't right here. Uh, and, and I think the interaction between doing a bottoms-up approach for, for inflation is really important, and doing so might make you sort of pull your punch a little bit more if you're going to be criticizing the fiscal stimulus. Great. Do you want to respond, Jared? Um, a little bit. I mean, uh, uh, or let me ask you a question too. One, one of the things before you were going to answer this too. One of the things I worry about is that we will have learned. Heidi's lesson is one lesson, which is that you, you you choose your response, and so fiscal policy can actually be effective. But I worry that the that the lesson will also be don't do that because you're going to get inflation. And what Greg says, this was a different kind of recession. And what Seth said does is also that inflation response going to be different too like should we learn the fact that if you if you go and sort of get fast recovery you're necessarily going to get inflation i think that's maybe the most important point from this conversation uh because i agree with you and i worry about this also that uh i talked about lessons i think we should learn i didn't talk about learning the wrong lessons and i think you you expressed it exactly right and i think when someone as sensible as greg uh points out the uh um, the sui generis characteristics of what we just went through and their impact on inflation, again, with the points that Seth made. If you kind of take the combination of the three things you just heard, uh, that would make a really important argument that I urge the three of you to work on together, <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or uh, separately, or however you like to do it. That's a really, really important argument that we should be leaning into so that we don't come out of this with the wrong lessons learned. Um, a couple of tiny points. Um, you know, the, the, the checks were, were means tested, but they, they may not have been as means tested as, as you wanted them to be. Um, I think in terms of, um, look, I think the, com the qu uh, discussion about fiscal sustainability is near and dear to my heart. It invokes uh, conversations about where growth is going, where interest rates are going. Uh, but I will encourage Greg and others to look at uh, the budget that we're putting out on March 9th uh, because we think we achieve um, uh, sustainability uh, in precisely the kinds of ways you'd like us to, um, given where uh, trajectories of, uh, of, of deficits in GDP go. Uh, but of course, you know, the president's budget is a, uh, is, 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 doesn't exactly pass go immediately. So, um, 
so we think you know, we're, we're sensitive to, to, to that trajectory that you describe. Um, and you know, the president would very much like to build on the 1.7 trillion record deficit reduction uh, we've achieved thus far, which for the record is not just spending cuts rolling off of, uh, of the COVID support, but in fact, a much larger effect comes from receipts. Uh, receipts which have um, come in stronger than expected in no small part due to the dynamics Heidi described about the strength of the, uh, of the recovery. Great. Okay, let's move on to your, I love this slide, riddle me this um, question, which is what's going on in the labor market? How do we explain the fact that we see the slowing in nominal wages, even though real wages and labor share are still depressed? Um, Heidi, I'll start with you. Okay, I can go for that. I, okay, so I do want to back up to yeah. this period at the end of 2020 when we got that big, we'd already gotten that big d dump in of jobs where people were just being brought back online. We still had a jobs gap of 10 million jobs. Um, and as we know, sitting there, the inflation was just about ready to really take off because of extreme pandemic sectoral shocks. So that's a situation. And if that, at that time, if you had asked me if I thought typical workers would be able to weather a huge inflationary spike caused by a pandemic a year later, also war, without basically a one-for-one -one drop in real wages, I would have said, no way. There's no way that's not happening because we had just come off of four decades of rising inequality and wage stagnation for most people, for most workers, for most of that period. And what that means is that employers held the cards, right? The, that working people had very little bargaining power. So the idea that that was going to turn around even an iota when we're in a global pandemic and we're in a 10 million jobs gap, it's just, that is just not what I would have predicted. But it is exactly what happened. Workers saw an acceleration of nominal wage growth that offset a huge chunk of the acceleration of inflation. It didn't offset all of it. So, for example, over the last two years, inflation measured by the CPIU increased 14% in total. And average nominal hourly wages for private sector workers increased 10.1% over that period. So it, wage growth didn't, nominal wage growth didn't fully offset the increase in prices. Real wages declined, but they declined a lot less than I would have thought. And, and before I go on, I just want to say I should note that I'm taking it as given here that inflation was basically not driven by wage growth itself, falling real wages, enormous pandemic shocks, the historically large contribution of rising profit margins to, pr to price growth, the global nature of inflation in this, in this era, they all make that actually pretty clear. And so given that, the question became, how much is the spike in inflation really going to hurt workers' wages and rising nominal wage growth Unic completely unexpectedly to me, I, others might have foreseen this, actually blunted some of that pain. And even within that, there were very unusual dynamics. So workers in low-wage industries that were hit the hardest by COVID, like leisure and hospitality, saw the strongest wage growth over this period. Racial wage gaps that have been growing steadily for the last 40 years actually narrowed during this period. Again, given the trends over the last four decades of, of who like holds the cards, right? Those things are just very, very much not what I would have expected. So why did they happen? Um, I think there's a number of things that contributed to, contributed to it. I'm going to focus on just a couple things that I think also give us an idea of maybe where things are headed. Um, so one, reason. My colleague Josh Bivens, who Jared mentioned, a different paper of his, he has coined a term that I really like um, called severed monopsony to explain. So w <laughs> one of the things that drove our wage stagnation um, for working people for most of the four decades leading up to the COVID recession was the decline due to relentless attacks of labor standards and institutions like unions that provided a broad swath of the labor market an actual counterbalance of power, counterbalancing like inherent employer power, that unequal balance of power that remained 
that, sorry, that unequal balance of power that happened as a result of that decline in things like labor standards and unions meant that workers often remained in jobs even at suppressed wages. But then the massive layoffs and business closures of the pandemic meant that employers' usual degree of monopsony power over their workers' wages was sort of abruptly diminished. Um, so that's one thing. And then another thing, it was our relief and recovery packages. And we sort of talked about that. They were game changers. I, I um, just, we, the, the uh, unbelievable job growth they created was, it was just, it was, we just have seen this unbelievably fast jobs recovery. And then the other thing is, as employers staffed up, they actually had to compete for workers, which you know is good for workers' wages. And then they had to do it in this context of workers having far fewer ties actually binding them to current employers, ties which, had they been in place, would have subverted a big chunk of that the need for employers to compete for workers. So I think all of this led to workers and some unlikely workers actually being able to weather the inflationary spike caused by the pandemic and war with substantially less than a one-for-one -one drop in wages. And so I feel like I've been going on forever. Do you want me to do the where I expect things yeah, to go? Do, yeah. I can, okay. So, the, so there's the, the, the where do I expect things to go from here? And I really like Jared's comment that, you know, we're, and also we, we were speaking in the, in the spirit of humility in the face of total uncertainty. I've been wrong <laughs> about a lot over the last three years. But what do I expect going forward? Okay, so for one, the extremely strong job recovery that we've seen over the last two years, the extremely strong job growth, that's unlikely to last. Um, so that means... I don't think, well, anyway, that's un, we're unlikely to see the same pace. So that means that the boost in leverage that workers got from having employers scrambling to staff up, that's not going to last either. And the severed monopsony boost to workers' bargaining power is also, I think, unfortunately going to fade out. And, and that will happen as the new employer-employee matches become cemented. Like, it's essentially that this, the same frictions that, hinders, that hindered workers' search for better jobs pre-COVID, they are very likely to reassert themselves as job openings rates get back to normal. Um, and then there's, I will just end with one, there's one other factor that I have not talked about that I think is worth ending with because it's a little bit of hope that maybe we'll see some of the increase in worker power and the better balance that that created actually continue even as the labor market softens. So very broadly, we know that individual workers have two basic sources of power. One, the implicit threat that they could quit their job and take another job. And that's what I've totally focused on. But there is another source joining together with your coworkers to make collective demands, being in a union. And it is worth noting that we also saw over this period a big increase in interest in unions. Public support for unions is at a more than 50-year high. NLRB election petitions have increased dramatically. Unions made high-profile advances, honestly, against all odds at places like Starbucks and Amazon. And those things do not have to dry up as the labor market slows. I do want to say that I think they will likely take a bit of a hit, and that's due to our unbelievably weak labor law that makes it really risky for workers to engage in union organizing. It's technically illegal in this country for employers to retaliate against workers for organizing, but the penalties are basically nothing, and so it happens all the time. Um, and so that means a labor market where there's just a ton of job openings, like the ones we saw over the last two years, um, that was great for workers' ability to take risks and organize. And the, as job openings come down to more normal levels, that will, that will then re-increase the risk of organizing because it means that if a worker is retaliated against, they're going to be less likely to be able to find another job in a reasonable time frame. So coming down from record job openings will likely put a damper on the growing interest in union organizing, but I don't think it's going to dry up completely. It totally remains to be seen. 
But I think there could be something of a structural shift underway with more workers recognizing the importance to their wages of collective action. And if that were to happen, if that happens, it will have a, a really positive impact on workers' wages going forward. And Great. there I really will <laughs> end. Okay. okay, so rather than let everybody else chance to respond to that, I'm going to move on to this question about inflation, and we're going to bring back into the labor market, which is like, how does that, how do we think about that confluence of what's going on with wages, what will go on with wages, and inflation. So when we say, so we've talked about the fiscal policy response and what happened in the labor markets, so now we're stuck with now the problem is that we're all worried about inflation um, and the prospect of a recession or a soft landing. Seth, what is, what, how, how do you think about the monetary response and what's going to go on from here? Absolutely. So um, uh, it has been said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, and so leave it to central banks. Uh, this may be one of those cases where we're in a slightly quirky position where it's mostly or po partly a, a monetary phenomenon. So what has happened? So the inflation took off. Initially, it was very much through consumer goods. Then it started to spread, especially for rent. And now, uh, as Chair Powell has emphasized, the, uh, the core services outside of, of housing uh, is part of the story as well. And so the Federal Reserve um, started reacting to it and started raising interest rates initially uh, somewhat slowly and then in leaps and bounds, 75 basis points at a clip. And so here we are now closing in on a federal funds rate uh, close to 5%. Uh, the Fed's last projections have them getting to just over 5% and then staying there for the rest of this year with the idea that they would be tightening financial conditions enough to slow the economy not just slow it down from the rapid pace we saw a year and a half ago or more, but to where it's slowing and it's growing below the potential growth rate of the economy for sufficient amounts of time that, in level terms, slack opens up and inflationary pressures go away. So I think that version of the story is, is, feels very standard cyclical uh, uh, macroeconomics, and, and I think it's the story that the Fed's telling, and, and I, don't, I don't see a particular reason now to criticize them for that. We can quibble about did they start soon enough, did they keep QE going on long enough, none of which matters at this point because I think it's, it's largely in the, in, in the rearview mirror. Um, so what is going on with inflation? How does it interact with labor markets, and what does it mean for, for monetary policy? I think here, again, Greg's framing of just how different this, this recession was is important. I think the discussions we just heard about the fight uh, in labor markets and perhaps a severed monopsony or at least a temporary change in, 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 in power, negotiating power, I think is very important. And so then to answer the question that Jared put up on the screen, what have we learned and puzzle me this, how are we seeing wage inflation coming down at a time when uh, other things still seem tight? I think they all actually fit together. My personal take on this, and I'd be curious uh, your views as well, is that part of what we saw in wages was a level shift higher. Uh, so we remember the slogans for more unionization, fight for 15. It was particularly acute at the lower end of the income distribution. And so if we think there was not literally from one day to the next, but over six months or so, a level shift higher in wages, that means that the normal cyclical patterns of more slack means slower wage growth, less slack means faster wage growth, was temporarily overwhelmed by this level shift higher that gave us for several months in a row measured wage gains that were particularly outsized. And now we're going back to the normal cyclical patterns there. And so it looks like we're getting this deceleration even with the tight labor market. And my personally fairly strongly held view is what we're seeing is the, the back end of that level shift. Um, and I think that that matters for lots of reasons. And, and um, that I'll come to in a second. So where is inflation going? Uh, goods inflation is now negative. Jared put the chart up on the screen. I think if you took the same chart Jared had and instead of doing it in growth rate terms, you did it in levels, you would see that there's still a far distance to go for the level of, in that case, auto prices to come back to the long run trend, which means that this negative month on month change for the level could go on for quite some time and help pull measured inflation down a lot more. Similarly, rent inflation uh, has gone up Spot rents have stopped rising, and so over the rest of this year, rent inflation should come down a lot, which will leave us with those other services. Um, so why does all of that matter? All of that matters because if we take um, the fact that Jared appealed to one of my competitors to have that model of how inflation might work in the economy, um, uh, wage inflation really shouldn't matter that much for goods inflation. And in fact, they're coming down even though wage inflation is high because a lot of the majority of consumer goods are imported. 
U.S. wage inflation isn't a direct input to imported goods, and so that those two are working at odds with each other shouldn't be surprising. Similarly, at least in core CPI, uh, rent inflation is 40% of core CPI, and there's not that same production function of labor as an input to rent a new, you know, to shift over to get a new apartment. And so again, that we're having those w inflation dynamics move in a different direction from uh, wage inflation, again, shouldn't be that surprising. So then we're left with this other core services outside of, outside of uh, housing. Um, and there I would just like to know that if you take something like the employment cost index and go back through until the, the 1970s, so leave out the 1970s, the super high inflation that was clearly eye-popping, we have seen other periods where employment cost index has gone up pretty dramatically with no subsequent rise in consumer price inflation. And if you do a bunch of egg-headed, wonky statistical analysis in the data, what you will find is that statistically, consumer price inflation leads wages the opposite direction, the feed through from wage inflation to consumer, final consumer prices is actually extraordinarily weak, even if you focus just on the other services component. Uh, it's not zero, it matters, but it's not as strong as I think uh, uh, people would like it to believe. So what does that mean? I think we're going to get a lot of fall in inflation over the course of this year, as goods inflation is negative, as shelter inflation falls. Um, th and so the, the, the anomalous, the non-cyclical part of inflation is now starting to go away on its own. And I agree with Jared. We need a good word that doesn't, that's not transitory, which sounds really, really <laughs> ephemeral. Uh, uh, but boy, it's the non-cyclical component. It's the non-textbook macro component of inflation, and that is going away on its own. So what does the Fed want to do? The Fed wants to say, okay, suppose that's right. What about the rest of it? The part that really is that cyclical inflation. How much is it? hard to know for sure. You can look at that other services component. But what they're trying to do then is to slow the economy down to keep aggregate demand below the productive capacity of the economy for long enough such that once the dust settles and that non-cyclical component of inflation has gone by the wayside and is in the rearview mirror, the rest of it, the rest of the cyclically driven inflation is brought back down to target. So how are they going to do it? They're going to, they're, they're, driving along by feel. It's really hard to know. Jared pointed out very appropriately that we shifted from star-based policy setting, having a strong view on where our star is or where U-star is. It's hard to know. And so they're waiting to see slowing in the economy. They're going to stay restrictive in their estimation until there's enough slowing for long enough that inflation is clearly on track. And then they're going to be data dependent, which you know is sort of fly by the seat of your pants, because what else can you do? Models are great, but there's only so much precision that any model is ever going to give you. Uh, it's a very difficult job, but that's how I see them going about doing it. Great. Greg, do you want to pop? Sure. Let, let yeah. me just say a couple of comments. Uh, first, the one thing we all agree on this panel is the need for humility. <laughs> that's an incredibly important one. I don't think there's any profession beyond macroeconomists that requires more humility than what we do. <laughs> you wouldn't always know that from watching CNBC, <laughs> but, we, but, but we macroeconomists have, have, a, have good reason to be humble. Um, in particular, I think Jerry made a very good point in his original comments, which is about U-star, which is the confidence intervals that U-star. The first person to make, that I saw make this point was actually a paper by Stager, Stock, and Watson many years ago, which is the first paper I've seen that not only estimated U-star, they actually econometrically generated a 95% confidence interval. And the shocking thing was how wide that confidence interval was, which basically said we had no clue <laughs> really what U-star is, more or less. Um, and so what, the question is, what does that mean? I mean, some people say, oh, therefore, there's no Phillips curve. So we'll throw that apparatus out the window. I don't believe that. But I do believe the Phillips curve is much more useful as a concept in economics textbooks <laughs> than it is as, as a practical monetary or fiscal policymaker. So I think it's much, much, much less useful um, than, we, um, uh, than we think. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, as I know Great. we're running out of time. I'm sure other people have comments. Yes. Um, Heidi, you have any, any words? You don't I, have to. Yeah. I could just talk really briefly about the, like, this question of how high can wages go without like, putting upper pressure on inflation. Yeah. This, like, the, if you, in normal times, in the very long run, you take, you know, if we have inflation running at 2% and productivity running at 1.5%, then essentially a 3.5% annual wage growth is like the long run sustainable. 
But we have seen this total smashing down of the labor share over the last three years. That means we actually have a lot of running room to stay at our higher levels of wages right now without putting upward pressure on inflation. And Josh Bivens, I keep, we keep referring to him, but I will just say, if we, just to, just to give you an idea of the numbers that we're talking about, if we use 20, or sorry, 2,000 labor share, the labor share that we had in year 2000 as our benchmark, wage growth at its current pace is possible without seeing inflation above 2% all the way to the end of 2036. Like that's the kind of wiggle room we have to have higher wages and, and like have, have labor sort of claw back what they've lost over these, you know, recent decades. Great. I'm going to give you a few minutes if you want to, pun it, and then I'm going to go into the, a few questions from the audience. Just two points. I think this has been a great conversation and a lot of food for thought. Some of this stuff, like my uh, Riddle Me This slide, feels a little overdetermined, like we have <laughs> um, more reasons why <laughs> we know more explanations for this than we can quite balance out. Um, but I'd like to uh, make two comments. One is sort of a, a question or a little bit of a challenge uh, to Heidi. Um, because I think the last point you made is really important, and as I said, um, you know, the idea that um, that uh, uh, rising labor share or tempered profit margins, again, I cited um, uh, Vice Chair Brainerd's uh, comments in this regard in my talk, uh, can pay for non-inflationary wage gains. Um, you know, that that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of dynamic that I think President Biden walks around uh, thinking about in terms of worker bargaining power and uh, the equalizing impact as Heidi and, you know, really your life work has underscored. Um, and, in fact, I was doing that work with you before you got there. Um, I, I hired, I hired <laughs> a policy institute, low these gazillion years ago. Um, but, you know, so, so you see, and this is sort of an econ Twitter thing, but it's, it's a real thing, too. You see... You see <laughs> You see people like, well, the Fed should just, you know, cut it out and, and, and you know, sort of kick back and, and not, you know, take jobs away. And, and we have, and, and, and the, you know, the, the kinds of dynamics that you and Josh uh, Bivens write about. I think one of the challenges, and maybe we haven't on the progressive side done enough to talk about this, is, you know, what mechanisms do we have yeah. to boost labor share? What mechanisms do we have to uh, restrain profit share? Um, now, you mentioned unions, which, of course, you know, are key, uh, but we need some, you know, we need more than that. Um, and, uh, and so I do think that, um, you know, I, I know Jason Furman talks about this in the spirit of, like, talk about, you know, yes, that's certainly algebraically correct, but, like, we want to think about the kind of hydraulics, the mechanisms that get us there. Uh, and, you know, the, the Fed has a, has a very strong and powerful and tried and true tool so, you know, I don't know that we have a tool like that on the other side. I'd like to think more about that. Um, last point, which I, I hope, uh, Greg, in, in particular, and I know you've worked, you know, you, you've led the council, so, you know, I hope this resonates with, with you as well as with the other panelists and with the audience. Um, so the humility point is a really strong one and good one, and we all, we all admit we're, we're very humble. Um, <laughs> 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 I, have a very, I have a very good joke about that, which I don't have time to tell right now. <laughs> See me later if you want a good joke. About that. Um, but there's another level of humility that I'd like to suggest, and that's kind of political economy humility. There are a lot of things that economists and sort of more mainstream economists, that's not a critique, um, see in um, uh, politics these days or politics forever that, you know, they don't like. It is, it's aesthetically displeasing to them. Uh, this was too, you know, this stimulus was too large, and this, you know, Buy America thing is, you know, against what, what we've learned and all that. And, you know, I'm, I'm trained in, in, in these economics, and I understand where all that is coming from. I really do. And, you know, in many cases, I share the critique, and I understand the rent seek and all of that. But there's a level of humility that I encourage us all to think about, which says we're trying to do you know, what we believe, what the president believes, what Heidi and I think what other people here believe is really great, important policy on behalf of strengthening workers. And um, sometimes that's not necessarily all kosher economics. Sometimes it's political economics. 
And sometimes you have to do things that may not be as aesthetically appealing in a neoclassical model to uh, get to the policies that uh, do a lot more good than harm. So, you know, I think that's another level of humility that I would ask us all to embrace. Great, thank you. Okay, we're going to open up with just a few audience questions right here. Wait, please wait for the mic. Uh, stand up and tell us who you are, where you're from. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Alexander Rafal with Tax Notes. Um, we talked a lot about sort of the, the demand sort of wage side, but there wasn't a lot of discussion in terms of the supply side structural issues of inflation, um, uh, particularly on the sort of supply bottleneck um, issues that sort of led to, you know, um, sort of with sort of higher um, demand and, and few goods and services. Um, you know, with, you know, the Biden administration's proposals um, for corporations, in particular the 15% minimum um, corporate tax, and then now also with um, high net worth individuals, um, a minimum tax as well, do you have any concerns um, that this could deter investment um, in those critical um, infrastructures, uh, supply chain issues that sort of led to um, part of the inflation? Thank you. Let me, you know, I'm going to take like two yeah, or three okay. questions, and then we'll answer the questions. Um, sure, go ahead in the back there. All right, thank you very much. Um, that, this was a great panel. Thank you all very much. This would be Jared Bernstein, please. Uh, just a, a, a very maybe a simple question. You had that sort of Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. you know, that the inflation rate came down and, and wage, wage growth came down a lot more fa faster than we would have expected when we're looking at the unemployment and the um, GDP pain. But when, when I was looking at that NHS thing that you have, mm -hmm. you have wage growth of that coming down a lot, but you don't really have as you said, the inflation rate is sort of stable through that whole yeah. period. So I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around that. I can quickly sort of answer both of those. Great. Um, uh, <laughs> so on the last question, uh, long and variable lags. Um, uh, so uh, I'm being glib. Um, you know, this is something that uh, economists who've dug into non-housing services will know. It is a dog's breakfast of a category. Um, it includes financial services, transportation, leisure, hospitality. Um, so um, it does correlate with um, uh, non-housing service wages in the way that I you know, kind of probably blew by too quickly in my presentation. Um, myself, Ernie, Tid uh, Ernie Tedeschi and I, uh, my colleague at the, at the council, um, did uh, look at the correlation between various, all the different wage measures and non-housing services inflation and the non-housing services wage measure uh, was the best. Um, it led, you know, it, 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 it uh, had the smallest error in predicting where non-housing services inflation was going. But the, R, but, but the correlation wasn't that high. So I think that those are related in the way that, you know, I argued they were. And if you look at Greg Ipp's piece today, and I think he, he gets into that a little bit. Uh, but I don't think the correlation is gangbusters by a long shot because it's such a dog's breakfast of a category. Um, um, on, the, on the point that you asked about, um, I, think that the, I, I think that there's separable issues here. I think the taxation that you've talked about is uh, really uh, uh, the least we can do uh, to achieve the president's goal of achieving um, more fairness in the tax code and um, trying to ensure that those who are at the very top, the most profitable, stop paying effective tax rates that are lower than uh, firefighters, nurses, and teachers. And I think that's what that's all about. I think if you're looking to the economy, our work on the economy supply side, in terms of both public and crowding and private investments, you need to look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, all of which we think have the potential to transform uh, the economy supply side uh, in terms of domestic production of chips, uh, clean energy, and of course, reversing decades of disinvestment in public goods. So we feel pretty strong about where we are there. Great. I think we have room for one more question. Uh, up front here, oh, we'll take two, actually. The first, <laughs> the two people right up front. I'm Annie Linsky with the Wall Street Journal. Thanks. Um, I, you didn't talk very much. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it and for taking my question. Um, uh, you didn't talk about very much about um, this sort of looming crisis ahead of the administration, which is a possibility of a default and the, if the de debt ceiling is not lifted. Just sort of given all of this sort of nuanced discussion that there's been about coming out of this last crisis, could you talk a little bit about 
what the impact of a debt ceiling, uh, passing a debt ceiling would be, um, the kinds of things that the administration is looking at to mitigate that impact or to prevent it from happening in the first place. Great. Just pass it to her and then we'll... Yeah, Andrea Ashalal with Reuters. Thanks for taking the question. Um, I wanted to ask um, about this kind of discussion that's starting now about whether the Fed needs to uh, think differently about its inflation target. Yeah. You know, is it time to sort of think about a slightly higher target or how long or how, how long they want to give themselves to get to the current target? I'm just really curious about that given what you've said about this being, you know, these are unprecedented times and the situation has really changed and particularly intrigued about the sort of step change in terms of wage growth, like whether, you know, that necessarily requires that inflation would be at a, a slightly higher level. Thanks. Great. Thanks. You want to talk about the debt ceiling? Um, uh, yeah, why don't you go, for, or somebody go first on the Fed. On the Fed. I hear you want to answer that one. So, <laughs> Seth, you want to you want to take the, or, or Greg? No, I'll you go first. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, I think the first thing is Chair Powell has been asked repeatedly about the 2% inflation target and has been uh, very clear that under his watch it's not going to change. Uh, 2% uh, has a long historical uh, lag to it partly uh, with, with Ben Bernanke contributing to the literature on it first and then the formal adoption of it at the Fed. Um, I think what's important from my perspective is the Congress sets a law for what the objectives of the Fed are. The Fed, the FOMC, interprets that law and then comes up with a way to make it, to use an overly Washington word, to make it actionable. Um, flexibility there, I think, is necessary because this discussion by itself just shows how different one cycle can be from another. So my personal view is any particularly rigid uh, uh, um, rule in legislation has a large probability of coming back to, to, to bite you in terms of uh, not giving the policymakers enough discretion. Um, I think the discussions we had about where the labor share of income is now relative to where it was in 2000, I mean, it fell pretty steadily from 2000 to 2015. We got a really tight labor market. It started to eke out some gains back up, but I think the research cited is, is, is helpful. I don't think the current rate of wage inflation in any way is, is, is telling you that you have to have a different target other than 2%. Can I, say, can I add something like, quickly yeah. to that? Yes, 2% is a long history. I agree with Seth on that. But it's also, if you look back at the history, it's kind of arbitrary. <laughs> so, so, you know, if, it, 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 I don't know any economist who would really go down to the mat about 2 versus 3. So if inflation gets down to 3, I wouldn't be surprised if they say, eh, 3 is kind of close to 2. <laughs> so, so I wouldn't be shocked if they, they're a little, they show some flexibility on that. Great. Now we're going to move to the debt ceiling. I just want to, I'm going to a little plug. So Wendy Edelberg and I have something up on our website that talks about the debt ceiling and and not just like the sort of what would happen, but the huge risks, the huge uncertainty. How would it unfold? What would the markets do? Would the would it, the minute we break, 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 breach the debt ceiling, you know, would you know all hell break loose, or would it be the slow dribble thing that would get? So I think the I'm just you pointing to that and talk, talk about thinking about really what would it look like if if, if we actually got there. You know, Annie, I, I hope you've heard some you know really thoughtful policy today from, from this panel, um, myself excluded. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the things we, one of the themes we, we, we've heard is that with a variety of critiques, you know, I don't think anyone, um, I don't think anyone contradicted my overarching point that uh, monetary and fiscal policy have put us in um, a uniquely strong place right now, particularly uh, referencing Heidi's comments uh, from the perspective of working people, a 3.4 percent unemployment rate, over 12 million jobs, 800,000 in manufacturing. I think you you know the numbers. The black unemployment rate at 5.4 percent, Hispanic at 4.5. Those are near historical lows. Those are the kinds of gains, achievements that are at risk uh, when we start thinking uh, about breaching the debt ceiling. Um, I tried to, in my, last, in my last slide, I talked about uh, potential risks or shocks to the forecast, and, I, and I'm just going to repeat what I said because I thought a lot about it. Um, 
The political own goal I have in mind is around the debt ceiling. It's never anything but the height of irresponsible governance to try to politicize or weaponize mm -hmm. what should be a pro forma action. It is, in fact, an unequivocally clear constitutional obligation to defend our sovereign debt and pay for existing spending obligations. But to play these games when, they're, when we're in the midst of a transition to more steady, stable growth, with the Fed in the midst of a hiking cycle and the rate of inflation coming down, is especially, and to my view, um, uh, just um, uh, unbelievably reckless. It's, it's, it's political malpractice of the highest type. Yeah. So do any of the other panelists want to take the Disagree. other side? And <laughs> <laughs> can I make one really fast, really fast point about this? It also is, a deal is also a big threat. So it's like we don't want to say, yes, the, everything Jared said I totally agree with, but we can't just say, oh, let's do a deal. It, it, the threat that it poses is huge. So to give an example from the Great Recession, the, uh, we had a debt limit deal in 2011 that did anti-austerity to the economy that was twice as big as the 2009 stimulus package. Like, it just obliterated it and was a key thing that caused our weak and slow recovery. So we have to also be careful about a deal. Okay. It's no bad. dumb policy. Yeah, no dumb policy. So uh, I want to thank uh, Louise, Jared, especially Seth, Heidi, and Greg for a lively conversation. I definitely want to call out Greg because I kind of collect good one-liners, and we all admit to being humble. It's one of the best lines I've heard at Brookings in a long time. Wait, <laughs> uh, we might make t-shirts about that. I can think of a number of people who might need two or three t-shirts. Uh, anyways, so thank you all for coming. We're going to post Jared's slides on our website, where you can also find the fiscal impact measure that he kindly referred to at the beginning. And the video will be on the website, so you can watch it over and over and over again. Thank you all for coming.